I think it's easy to get kind of locked behind the numbers, 27, 30 million. Those are conservative estimates of people who are enslaved today. $32 billion a year industry, the trade in flesh and human beings. See, that can become a block, right? How often do we get bombarded with all the negative things that are happening in our world? We can't get stuck there. If we do, we're all in big trouble. Not just those who are enslaved, we are too, because we know that our calling must be to be with those who are enslaved today. So that's what we are. And I love how Roger opened up. Absolutely, this is not a movement of sociologists, which is my background, by the way. It's not just a movement of business people. Okay, that's also my background. <laughs> It's not just psychologists. It's not just, you know where I'm going with this. This is a movement for all of us. It's the ultimate interdisciplinary movement. It requires all of us to stand together and move forward, linked together to fight slavery today. And you may not know, know it now, but you're an abolitionist. Did you know that? Anyone here know that they're an abolitionist? There we go. We got some here. By the time you leave, we all hope, you will realize that you are an abolitionist. And I want to tell a story of a woman named Krunam. See, Krunam was an artist. She was not an abolitionist. She was an artist. She lives in Thailand. She was in Chiang Mai. And she would leave her house every single day and walk across the city to her art studio and she'd always see kids out on the street and she would wonder why all the kids are on the streets and so she started to engage with them and talk with them and for literally a year just by talking with them she did not even begin to understand why they were on the streets and it wasn't until she used her own gift which was being an artist that she took a canvas and paints and she went out and she worked with the kids and she said just paint have fun. And to her, her horror, she realized through the painting, some of the most horrific images started coming out on the canvases. She's like, how could these young kids, as young as five years old, know about these types of things? A depth of exploitation that we'd wish upon no one. And that's how she learned. Many of these kids weren't from Thailand. They were from Burma, Myanmar, southern China, Vietnam, Laos. And they had been brought into Thailand and forced to work in, forced, had sex forced upon them in the karaoke bars of Chiang Mai. And she was filled with righteous anger. And she did what you should never do. She ran in and she snagged three boys out of the karaoke bar that night. It's not a very sophisticated intervention style. Don't do that. For one, it's illegal here in the United States. So when we met Krunam, it was in 2006, and she had 26 kids, and she, did, she didn't know what to do with them. I have no kids, and I don't know what to do with myself. So I can only imagine. Put yourself in her shoes, 26 kids, no place to, to put them. They were literally sleeping in cemeteries under trees. So some land was gifted to her in the north of Thailand, up in the Golden Triangle region. And we said to her, you know, Kurnam, we're growing this thing called Not For Sale. We will commit to you that we will help build uh, a structure for you so the kids can live in the structure. So we raised enough funds to build this first structure, and we call Krunam, and we say, fantastic, great news. We have enough funds to build the first structure. And she goes, that's great, guys, but now there's 57 kids. Ugh. We need to get some more family and friends to help raise some more funds for a second building. So we did that. We extended our family and friend network. 
We twisted some arms. We called Kurnam. We said, great news. There's 56 kids. We now have two buildings. And she said, that's great, guys. But now I have over 90 kids. Oh. Well, that's what this movement is about. It's about extending that network of family and friends. That's what the modern-day abolitionist movement has to be. It has to be a network of family and friends who are united together under the banner of freedom. And I think there's no better place to spark that than within the church. We know what it means to live together, to commune together, to break bread together. Today, there are over 156 kids in northern Thailand. And I'm really happy to, to tell you that four of them just graduated from university. Completely unheard of just five years ago. 60 of them are off at some of the top high schools and universities in Thailand, which is just great. The point here is that Krunam had a door open for her. And through a step of faith, she walked through that door. And then another door opened. And then another door opened. And what you'll find within this movement is that once you hear that calling, you, you take that vocation, that each door continues to multiply by 10, and then 100, and then 1,000. I have no doubt that there's favor upon this movement. It's incredible. But Krunam was an artist who is now an abolitionist. What are you? Are you an artist turned abolitionist? The thing is, is you don't have to be Harriet Tubman. You don't have to be William Wilberforce. You have to be yourself. That's what this movement is about. It's about you finding your place. That's what Krunam found when she took that step of faith. Now, Krunam is at the bottom of the river. She's pulling bodies out, and that is an incredibly important place to be. That's compassion. That's love. But guess what? We have to marry that compassion and love, like Roger said, with our minds. And that's what we have to do. We have to start moving upstream. Because if we stay at the bottom of the stream, pulling bodies out, we'll never figure out why upstream there are millions of bodies being thrown into the river. Right? We have to start walking upstream. So that's what we're attempting to do at Not For Sale. This is Mariana. Mariana runs our project in, Thailand, or in Romania. So what Not For Sale does is we find partners who work locally, and we empower them to do that compassion-based work. Just last year, we helped directly well over 1,000 survivors of trafficking on every continent, except for Antarctica. I know someone was thinking it. I always get that, what about Antarctica? <laughs> it's happening everywhere. I'm going to show you a sh short video here about a model that we're taking at Not For Sale to move upstream. Not For Sale creates tools that engage business, government, and grassroots in order to incubate and grow social enterprises to benefit enslaved and vulnerable communities. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union in Eastern Europe, the trafficking of women and girls from East to West has been at an all-time high. In Amsterdam's red light district, 70% of the women behind the windows are from Romania, Bulgaria, and Hungary, often living under threat of violence, brought there by means of coercion, and locked under debts from their source country. To address this underground supply chain of human beings, Not For Sale provides survivors of slavery with psychological counseling, legal services, education, job training, and reintegration programs. These resources empower the survivors and help to free them from cycles of exploitation. But aftercare alone is insufficient. To eliminate sex slavery in Amsterdam, abolitionists must address the root causes. 
For example, the lack of job opportunities for young women in Eastern Europe. Young women, especially those who are poor, uneducated, or stigmatized, often struggle to find work in Eastern Europe. Such women frequently fall victim to the scams of organized trafficking networks. For two days, Not For Sale assembled world leaders in government, culture, and business at the Montera Circle Amsterdam. We asked them to strategize ways to create jobs for people vulnerable to slavery in Eastern Europe. There are more slaves in the world today than at any other point in human history. Men, women, and children forced to toil in the rugloom sheds of Nepal, break rocks in the quarries of Pakistan, sell their bodies in the brothels of Rome, and fight wars in the jungles of Africa. Solving a global crisis will take more than a single answer. To re-abolish slavery, we will need sustainable solutions in specific regions that can successfully be replicated across the globe. To design these world-changing models, we will need the minds of the best and the brightest, convening together from every sphere of society. This is the Montero Circle. Not For Sale begins by targeting a specific region of the globe where human trafficking is rampant and stoppable and deploys its expertise on the ground to develop 65% of the solution. Then we get down to business. For 24 hours, Not For Sale convenes global leaders from every major sector of society. Business, culture, faith, academia, law and government, and ask them for their mind share. These leaders dialogue and debate to design an innovative, replicable solution to a specific manifestation of one of the world's most pressing problems. There are moments to read history, and there are moments to make history. Welcome to the movement to end slavery in our lifetime. Welcome to the Montero Circle. At the Montero Circle Amsterdam, European retail giant Hema committed to sell in its stores all produce and potentially all products that Not For Sale generates in Eastern Europe. And in response, investors such as Heineken, Diageo, Juniper Networks, and Google.org committed a total of $300,000 to scale Not For Sale's farm in Romania where survivors of slavery can be employed. And that is only the first step. Not For Sale is collaborating with other farms in vulnerable regions of Eastern Europe, such as a Hungarian co-op that represents 300 family farms. Not For Sale is offering the farms access to Hema's markets. In turn, the farms adopt labor standards based on free-to-work and agree to employ survivors of slavery and people vulnerable to slavery. Not For Sale will receive a portion of the farm sales, which we will reinvest in Eastern Europe. Creating jobs in Eastern Europe confronts the root causes of sex slavery in Amsterdam. As business develops between Hema and the farms, it will support the vulnerable communities where the farms operate. In time, we will replace Europe's underground supply chain of human beings with product supply chains that dignify their workers. Around the world, from the Peruvian Amazon to the cities of India, from the farms of Eastern Europe to the markets of Western Europe, Not For Sale is marrying compassion and business to make the global fight against slavery comprehensive. We are deploying leaders and solutions that will not only mend slavery's damage, but also combat its causes. Only with comprehensive solutions can we end slavery in our lifetime. So I'm going to say something that maybe is a little bit shocking or stirring. Charity is dead. You're from a nonprofit. What are you talking about? No, charity is dead. If we are going to end slavery today, we can't have NGOs walking around going, please, please, just, just, give, me some, just give me some money, please. That's not how you change systems. That's not how you break the bonds of slavery. We need to start building mutually beneficial platforms and programs that allow 
anyone and everyone to be an abolitionist. And you're saying, that's great. Well, you're working with HEMA and Google.org and all. Of what does that mean to me? Well, it means everything to you because if we don't have the grassroots behind us, we are nothing. There's no policy change. There is no change in the way businesses do business. It was mentioned in the video about free to work. Free to work is your way to engage. How many of, uh, how many of you here uh, buy things? Yeah, I, every hand goes up. Come on, you're buying your education. <laughs> we all consume, right? And unfortunately, that means every one of us touches slavery every single day. Again, let's not get stuck there. Let's not go, oh, that's too much. We have to start building the platforms that allow us to make a decision about how we purchase. That's what free to work is all about. It does really two big things. One, it empowers us to be smart about our purchases. So if you have an iPhone or an Android, oh, Take it out and download the free-to-work app right now. If you have a Nokia, just smash it. We don't have it. <laughs> just kidding. Have you ever considered the story behind the products you purchase? Take the example of cotton, the world's most valuable non-food crop. 80 countries harvest cotton, 16 of which have documented cases of forced child labor. And in places like Uzbekistan, during harvest each year, two million children are forced to pick cotton for up to 70 hours a week. These abuses are not limited to cotton, but affect nearly every industry. A product can be produced in multiple countries and change hands over a dozen times, creating a complex supply chain. Without effective monitoring, abuses can easily occur. Every product has a story. The shirt on your back, the phone in your pocket, your child's favorite toy. Each of us has a role in the story behind the barcode. What's yours? So as I said, I'm sorry I bashed Nokia. If you have Nokia, it's fine. Keep it, don't smash it. We have the, I heard a droid. Just to mess with me. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Look, if we as a movement start purchasing products that get an A through F, you all know how, how that works, right? See, what we've done with the U.S. State Department is build a tool that allows us to understand the transparency, the policies, the procedures behind a major corporations' supply chain practices. And it spits out a grade. A through F. So when you go into a store, let's say Target or, or Walmart, and you scan a product and it pops up an F, and they're doing little to nothing to mitigate the risk of forced labor in their supply chain, are you going to buy that product? No. I hope not. But okay, it's one thing to, to, to boycott. It's another thing to boycott. That's what we advocate. Buy the products from those who are doing things to mitigate forced labor. Because I hate to tell you this, there's no clean supply chain in the world. None. It's just, it's not the case. Not right now. We're working towards that. But if we start buying the, the A's and the B's on free to work, it will happen very, very quickly that you start seeing supply chains clean up very, very quickly. Now, this was just my teaser. I'm going to go deeper into this at 130, 130, 130. Come back at 130. I think it's 130. Okay. I was coached well. <laughs> 130. <laughs> so you could be saying, okay, I don't like buying things. All those other fancy things you're doing are fine. But I'm an athlete because I believe we've got to put things in the stream of our lives. Because 
I'm a social justice geek, but doesn't mean that everybody is. I even gave up sports to become a social justice geek. That's how big of a nerd I am. So we developed something called free to play. And we're getting Major League Baseball players. We even got an email a couple of years ago from this guy. He's a pitcher, a great believer named Jeremy Affelt, who just signed with the San Francisco Giants. And he said, I heard about what you're doing. How can I help? So for every strikeout Jeremy throws, he gets $250 to help free kids around the world. Pretty cool. Well, we're building a tech platform where you could match Jeremy. So that's going to be coming out at the beginning of the baseball season. So you could pledge, let's say, a penny every time he strikes someone out. Or my favorite player, I'm from Minnesota. Any Minnesotans in the room? Whoop, whoop. Yeah. Nobody. <laughs> oh, you're just shy, Minnesotans. All right. <laughs> Joe Maurer. Let's say you don't like Joe Maurer. For every time he strikes out, you could give a dollar if you're vindictive. But we're not that way, are we? <laughs> so in March, I was in uh, Uganda. Uh, we have a project we just finished up there. And I met this guy. His name is Adrian Peterson. And believe it or not, I was driving north and, uh, to Gulu, and I got an email on my phone from my brother, and he said, you'll never believe what Adrian Peterson said. Adrian Peterson equated his $10.5 million contract to modern-day slavery. No joke. And I don't believe in coincidence anymore. I never, <laughs> never could, but especially with not for sale, I do not believe in coincidence. Six hours later, I walked into a dinner, and there was Adrian Peterson sitting in Gulu, Uganda. And I walked right up to him and I said, Adrian, do you even know what you said and what that means? I'm just kidding. I don't have the guts to do that. There's no way <laughs> I didn't do that. In fact, I, I slunked into the corner and I ate my food by myself, feeling a little bit shameful that I didn't have the guts to go up to Adrian. But the next day, I was with our project leader. His name is Father Tony. He's a rough and gruff Wisconsinite. Any Wisconsinites in the room? Yeah, see? Come on. Where's the Minnesotans? Come on. <laughs> yeah. Father Tony, the rough and tough uh, uh, project leader. I, we're driving across town. And I go, Father Tony, there, there's Adrian Peterson again. And he pulls the car over and he rolls down the window and he goes, Hey, you, get over here. And I'm thinking to myself, what are you doing? That's Adrian Peterson. Uh, that, you can't do that, Father Tony. Father Tony's like, ah, he's just another human being just like you and me. And Adrian, Adrian Peterson walks over and Father Tony goes, I'm Father Tony. I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. Yeah. And I quickly jump in, I go, no, 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 I'm from Minnesota, and I'm a huge Vikings fan. Uh, you have to, otherwise you're not allowed to even land in Minnesota. And I said, I, I blame everything on my brother. I said, my brother won't believe that I met you. Do, you. do you mind if I get a picture with you? And he goes, sure, sure. So I get out, I take a picture with him. My sister says I look a little too happy. <laughs> <laughs> you're all thinking it. <laughs> And he turns to me, he goes, so why are you here? What do you do? And normally I'll go, ah, human trafficking. I just go, I fight modern day slavery. And his face just, he literally had said those words that was put in the Minneapolis Star Tribune newspaper less than 24 hours before that. And he was, had the unfortunate luck of running into me in Uganda. So we started to talk. He was so open. We ended up talking for 25 minutes about how he could get involved. Uh, it turns out he worked with another organization. That's fine. Glad he's involved. Pretty incredible. Again, this is not a human-run movement. This is not about me, Mark Wexler, or any single organization or a government. There's no way. There is no way we will end slavery today if we think it's about me or if it's just about us as this 
crew right here. There's no way. That's why I was like, we have to engage athletes. We have to engage business people. We have to engage me, the social justice geek. We all have to be a part of the movement. So I don't know if there's some athletes in the room. Maybe you want to think about free to play. What about pledging every goal you score on the soccer team next year? Five dollars to help free kids around the world. Sometimes when I was still bad, I would surf and forget everything that was bothering me. One day, a friend brought me to a competition. And from then on, I started to surf professionally. I came forth in my first competition, and then I started to participate in national events. Some I would win, others not because I was not concentrating. I continued surfing and I finished high school last year. Now I will go to university to study architecture. Free to Play is a platform within Not For Sale that engages athletes, musicians, and artists to use their creativity and their passion in the fight against the modern day slave trade. If I want to say, hey, I really have compassion for other human beings, I want to show it. And I get a drive to like go out there and you know, I want to strike this guy out or I want to gain this hold because I know that this strike or this hold is going to actually free somebody. It doesn't matter if you are a pro or an amateur. Regardless of the skill level, we believe that you can take what you love to do and do it so that you truly can affect the lives of others and help us build real, long-term, sustainable change. We believe that all children should be free to play. So I want to leave you with uh, um, something that was imparted to me in March of last year when I was in Gulu in Uganda. Um, you can see here, um, one of the projects we worked on was a rehabilitation and reintegration program using play, using dance. And here you see the girls dancing with the clay pots on their head. And you know, I, I'll admit, when they first started to dance, I was like, oh, oh man, uh, what if they drop? <laughs> My eyes kind of lit up. It's like, oh. And I was there with uh, uh, three traveling companions. And uh, after the girls finished, one of the leaders came up on stage, and he looked straight at the four of us, and he said, leaders, leaders. Why did your eyes light up when the girls started to dance with the pots on their head? Why did your eyes light up? Because leaders, if those pots fall off and they crash and they break, tomorrow we can just take them, we can reshape them, and we can put them back together. There will be a pot again soon. But leaders, and we're all leaders, My society, my culture, which was devastated by war and by enslavement, it cannot be put together again in a day. The systems that drive the global economy, the marketplace, we cannot control that here in Uganda. So it is up to you as leaders Less than 1% of the world will get a college education. Less than 1% of the world will be sitting where you're sitting, will be gifted with the skills that you will be gifted with. How are you going to use them? Are you going to use them just to make money for yourself? That's fine. But I don't think that's what we're called to do. And it may not be abolition, it may be 
the environment? How do I use my skill for the environment? How do I use my skill for others? But we have to find our calling. And the truth is, we all can and should be abolitionists because we can shift the way we purchase. We can shift the way we live, live our lives. So let's not worry about the little things, the pots. Let's set our gaze higher because that, because that is where you are. You are empowered and in a place to make system change. It may be in the university you work in later on in life. It may be in the church you work in later on in life. But we're all abolitionists. Thank you.